to have you here. So delighted to celebrate International Women's Day. And old enough to remember a time, I was born in 1962, we used to live in a small cave with a little Tyrannosaurus Rex outside just <laughs> guarding us. We used to occasionally write our initials in the wall of the cave using a piece of rock. That's how long ago it all was. But, but I remember the very first time I was asked to be on radio, to be a guest on a radio program. I'd never done it before. I was a journalist and I, and I, and I arrived in the studio nervous as hell, as you can imagine. And I was scared stiff and I was trying to plan in my head what to say and I wasn't sure what to say. And somehow or other, when the red light went on and the question came out, I was, I was quite good at it, you know. I was quite funny. I was quite fluent. I was quite surprised by what I myself was saying. I couldn't believe it. And you know when in life you suddenly find yourself quite good at something. Anyone who remembers or recognizes this, you're not necessarily sure you're going to be good. You actually are good at something. You really enjoy it, right? It could be a subject at school. It could be a sport. It could be something you do at home. It could just be putting your false eyelashes on. There's just something you're good at. And you love doing it because you're good at it. And I loved it. And when I got back, um, I remember phoning my mum and dad to say, you know, what did you think? What did you think? Did you think I was good? Was I any cop at this? And my mum said, what does your husband think? Is he happy for you to be out at night doing this? What did he say? What does he think? And I come from an era where that wasn't at all unusual. The idea that a woman might find something she excelled in, might find something she had ambitions in, might find something that no one in her family had ever done in a million years, but she actually was good at and felt kind of, you know, I suppose spoke to a part of your soul and your heart, your brain, your personality. What does your husband think? What does he think about that? Is he happy for you to do this? I mean, what do we think of that? Raise your hand if you think that's an acceptable reaction. Raise your hand if you think what they should have said was, my God, you are absolutely effing amazing, Vanessa. <laughs> we were so proud of you. This was incredible. Could this be an opportunity? Could this change your life and take you in any kind of other direction? Wow, we will support you in any way we can. Not a bleeding bit of it. So what I'm hoping is that life has changed for you completely, that you won't recognize any of that stuff. There won't be, first of all, find a husband before you can even begin on a real life. Forget that, or a wife, or a partner of any kind. You are your own best friend and partner through life. I hope, does anyone understand and get that completely already? You're your own best friend and partner. Raise your hand if you really get that. Totally, it's you, it's all on you. And that is a great freedom and also a great responsibility because you've got to pilot yourself through life. This is one of the big things, one of the main things I've learned, but you don't want to hear much more from me, do you? So let me introduce the panelists to you in a little bit more detail. Let's say, first of all, welcome to our dynamic and remarkable Olympian. We are honored even to be breathing the same air as Nicola Adams OBE, quite frankly. She is a first in absolutely everything. She's incredible. She's the first female boxer to win Olympic gold in 2012. Woo! No, she changed the face of boxing. She woke women up to the fact that they could get in the ring and they could really slug the absolute beef out of it. And they could do it with skill and elegance and refinement and credible athleticism. She has knocked our socks off. She won gold at the Rio 2016 Games. Oh yes, she's won every single thing you could actually win. Isn't that true? The Commonwealth, European, the world champion. She's aced the whole damn thing. Amateur, professional, all of it. She's absolutely extraordinary. As I said, she's already an OB. Did you see her on Strictly? That was another first. That was the first same sex coupling with the wonderful Katya Jones. They were beautiful, actually, to watch. Incredibly moving, incredibly graceful, amazingly beautiful. And um, it's an absolute honor and a delight to have you here, Nicola. Thank you so much for being here. Now, sitting next to her is the gorgeous Montana Brown. You know, Montana, I'm sure you watched her. Hands up if you saw her on Love Island. Probably don't recognize me with the clothes on. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> I think she looks great with the clothes on. We've seen her with the clothes off, also fantastic. Um, she will answer your questions about many very important things. You may think reality TV is very important. It's only been a big, big, big slice of my life. I was in the very first uh, celebrity Big Brother ever before anybody even realized that reality TV was a thing. No one even knew. When we went in as innocent lambs to that show, little did we know we were going to be scarred for life by the experience <laughs> I still haven't recovered from. I'm not joking. I wrote help on the table in chalk while wearing a leopard skin dressing gown. I could have done that. We could have reenacted that today. It would have been quite good. <laughs> um, so I know a little bit about what it's like on reality TV. But Montana, since that, has, has been subject to all kinds of 
trolling and all kinds of, you know, horrible stuff online. And she's had some issues with mental health that she's very bravely going to talk about. So anything you want to talk to her about, social media, the pressure to look a certain way, what it's like to be suddenly famous, whether it's all good or not good, what fame is really like, she's here and she's going to courageously answer all your questions on that. Now, sitting next to Montana is the incredible Kate Ferdinand. Why do I say that? Because I really mean it. I think she's just an amazing person. She's she's famous for many things. She's also famous for reality telly. Did you see her on TOWIE? Did you see her on that show? That was a long time ago. Long time ago. <laughs> well, that's how she started. She's also famous for being part of a real dynamic duo with her husband, Rio, and for being... I would say the poster girl for blended families. I mean, she's she's woven a family from a husband who loves her and three very heartbroken children who had lost their mum. She's also got a little boy with her husband, Rio, too. And she's managed to, to kind of make sense of a very, very difficult, complicated scenario. Anybody sitting here who is part of a blended family? So it's not just your mum and dad and you lot. It's, it's, it's steps and other people. Might, anybody, you must be. Somebody must be. Yeah. Anybody else? So everybody, yeah. So everybody knows that it's it's a complicated thing to do. So Kate's going to talk to us about that and about mental health issues and all of that. And sitting next to me uh, here is the Minister Against Violence Against Women, pretty much. Would you say that's a way of summing up what you do? Absolutely. Yeah, Sarah Dines, who is... Um, a remarkable person, went to a comprehensive school, carved an amazing career in an arena, which is politics, which is known to be unbelievably toxic for women. Is that true? That is true. Very, 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 very difficult. And she's minister. She's done an amazing, amazing job. She's a mother of four boys. Um, and we'll talk to you all about all that. So why don't I start by asking all of you the same question, then we'll get into some very difficult, different questions. Nicola, you first. What are you most proudest of in your career that has got you to be here today celebrating International Women's Day? Um, definitely my Olympic gold medal in 2012, just because when I first started boxing, women's boxing wasn't even really a thing. I was the only girl in the gym. Um, girls were told, you know, why don't you play tennis or you're too pretty to box or women belong in the kitchen. You know, all those kind of comments. So to then have the fight to get women's boxing into the Olympics and then to be able to win a gold medal in your home country, like in London. I mean, it was it was any Olympians, you know, dream to be able to win a gold medal in your home country. But to make history as well, it was unbelievable. Montana, some people might think that you would say that the thing that you're proudest of was getting through the auditions and ending up on Love Island because there you were on the telly and there you were achieving whatever it was you thought that you wanted to set out to achieve. But I'm kind of thinking now, looking back, although it was obviously a great triumph to get on that show, maybe it didn't it didn't necessarily fulfil all the dreams you had for it. I, I think once you go on a reality show, it kind of we were talking about this earlier, it kind of puts you into a box. So I'd say something that I'm really proud of is starting my own business and becoming an entrepreneur through the help of having that platform um, was something that I'm really, really proud of. And again, like I think there's a lot of confidence issues that you have as a woman kind of being in the business space. It's mostly male dominated. So what kind I think, of business is it? So I have a sustainable swimwear company. Uh -huh. So I've been doing that for four years now. Um, but along the way, I went into business with men and struggled with that and um, had the wall pulled over my eyes. And I think that was a real eye opener for me, especially because I was so young. I was only 22. Um, so yeah, I'm really proud that I'm, I've still got the company um, with my founder, female founder, and uh, yeah, I love doing what I do. Well done, amazing. <laughs> and Kate, you, 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 you cover so many, so many areas really. Should we, should we focus on the, on the blended family first? Because I know you've got this incredible podcast, there's a book, there's a book explaining it to children, and it is a situation that so many people find themselves in. And it's difficult, isn't it? It can be. It can be tough. I think any family life is hard sometimes, but it can be tough. I suppose I'm proud of the fact that I've come from a reality TV show. And when I wanted to start Blended, I wanted to start because I didn't really see anyone else standing up for people in a blended family. And a lot of people didn't really believe in it. And I had the idea and lots of people like, mm, I'm not sure. I don't think it's really going to work. And I suppose I'm proud that I just carried on and believed in myself. And how, how did you get the confidence to carry on? When people say, 
you know, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be any good. You won't be any good. How do you, where do you find that self-belief to carry on? I mean, I was really passionate about it. I struggled. I'm a stepmom and my three stepchildren have lost their mum. Lots of grief, lots of different emotions. And I just felt like it, something was needed. And I could really see that there was a gap and other people messaging out, reaching out to me, sorry, saying like, we need your help. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. And I think just stepping out of that box, like Montana said, of a reality TV star and making the change. I think I'm proud of that for just trusting my instincts and going with it. Do, do you think people found it more difficult to take you seriously or they knew you and so they could take you seriously? I think or both, when, maybe. Um, I don't think they took me very seriously. No? I think okay. when you're on a reality TV show, I mean... You film for hours and hours and only an hour showed a day. And you might be on it for 30 seconds, maybe. Um, So they don't really know the true you or all sides of you. I, at the time, was going through a breakup. So that was just one side of my personality. Um, So I found that quite difficult. I felt like I was judged because I was on the show and no one really knew me. So it's helped me to just be myself and be okay with that. And what about you, Sarah? Because, I mean, some people would say, in fact, we had, do you know, have you heard of Nadine Doris? She was a minister for culture. She's been an MP for years and years. She was in uh, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here as well. And she writes some incredible books. But she said the other day that she would tell her daughters, do not go into politics. And yet you did. I was always interested in politics. I, like probably many of you in the audience, came from a very normal background. I was brought up in Basildon, similar age to Vanessa. And at a time when people didn't do stuff. And I remember numerous occasions being told at school, why um, do you want to do this? No, do that. I wanted to be a barrister. And I was a lawyer, a barrister for 30 years. I remember going for my careers interview at the school. And the lady who was very kind said to me, people from around here don't do that. That is what they said. They said you can do other stuff, some really great other professions like hairdressing or pre-nursing at my local sixth form college. But that wasn't what I wanted to do. And it was putting girls and women in a pigeonhole. And I said, no, I want to do something else. So I worked really hard. And the one thing I found in this country is if you work hard and you take help and every opportunity, Vanessa, the world is your oyster, girls. You can go for it. So what was I most proud of? Well, I think it was actually being sworn in as a member of parliament when there's still too few women in parliament. And it is hard. Nadine often says, would you really say a woman should go into parliament? Do you know what it is hard? I do have those moments when I dare to look at Twitter when people say the cruelest things. All you girls here have had that. And you think, why? But then you think, if I don't, who is going to? Somebody's got to do it. So I say to all you girls here, get out there. Take every opportunity The world is out there for you. Think of something that helps you. It may be your mum, your sister, your best friend, or your teacher. Take every opportunity. And that's what I did. And my mum used to say to me, you're as good as anybody. You can do it. And just believe in yourselves. I think that's the main thing. Is there anybody here who might fancy a career in politics, wants to change the world, wants to make things different for other people? Anybody? (coughs) One lady there. Anybody else? I feel like asking you, why not? I feel, I feel like at your age, you should be thinking, well, I don't like this and I don't like that. And I want to change absolutely everything about absolutely everything. Let me ask you about something that loads of people are focusing on these days and it's impossible to ignore. And I'll start with you, Nicola, again. And that is social media and the impact of it on your life, on your career and on your confidence as a person. Yeah, it can be really, really difficult um, sometimes, especially because... It's so easy to get in contact with with people now. You, you just literally pick up your phone and you can tweet and you can go on Instagram, you can comment. And But for me, I guess how I get around those ne- negative comments is I only listen to the people that are closest to me, my, my friends, my family, my team. They're the opinions that matter to me. Anybody else, it's just, you know, it's just noise in the background because they don't really know you personally so I never really I never take that to heart and there's always the little block button as well it gets it gets too much <laughs> what about you Montana because you've struggled I think with this so explain what it was like when you came out of Love Island so you're in TV and it's on TV and it's basically a bubble yeah and then you come out and I don't know what you thought it was going to be like so maybe you'll tell us first of all what you imagined it would be like and then what it was really like 
Well, I actually thought no one was going to see it. So I didn't actually tell my family that I was going on it initially because I thought, oh, no one was going to see it because it wasn't really that much of a big show um, kind of beforehand. And then I was really shocked because I feel like when I went to university, I never used to care about what I looked like. I just, I was, I've always been like a tomboy. Um, so I think coming out and seeing people judge my appearance, that was the hardest thing for me because even um, even when I was on the show, kind of people were talking about kind of Botox and things like that. And I think being like a 21, 22 year old, I was like, oh, what's that? Like, because I'd kind of grown up not knowing what that was and not thinking that was normal. Um, and then it was kind of people trolling me saying like, oh, you should get this done and you need that done. And I just was really disheartened because I thought, oh my gosh, I now need to change everything. And I remember I went through a phase of being really, really insecure and it massively uh, detrimented my mental health social media because I, I didn't know how to handle it. I was like, okay, well, if I get this filler and I get this Botox and whatever, then, you know, everyone will be happy and then they won't judge me. So I ended up getting this really awful filler, had chin filler, like bearing, bearing in mind I was 22, did not need anything done at all. Um, and so then obviously I thought, oh great, no one's going to judge me now. And then even more kind of hate started coming like, what have you done to your face? And I was like, oh, I was like, people notice. Um, so it was just, I think that was kind of the, a really low moment for me and I thought actually I can't live like to please everybody I'm just gonna have to be happy with the way I, the way that I am the way that I look and then everything else will come and I think the self-love journey really started then because I thought if I don't love myself and I'm not happy with the way that I am just no Botox no nothing just me being me um I think that's a good place to start so if there's one thing I, I would say especially with social media just take it with a pinch of salt and you know everyone's beautiful in their own unique way and I think we all kind of strive to look like people on Instagram or look like celebrities. And actually, the beauty's in your uniqueness. So don't try and change the way you look. I, just say that's, I think that's very honest. I just say of all the people I've interviewed in my life, and I've been doing this for an awfully long time, I've interviewed loads and loads of women who are celebrated for being really beautiful. Everyone thinks they're beautiful. Everyone wants to look like them. Everybody buys products because they use them, because they look so gorgeous. And not a single one of them that I've interviewed has got an ounce of confidence. They always say, oh my God, I look absolutely terrible. I look like the back, the, you know, back end of a bus. Don't look at me, don't look at me. And you think, but hang on, but you're famous for being beautiful. That's what everybody loves about you. That's what everybody likes. And yet somehow, I always find that these women, just as you say, when everyone was saying, oh my God, look at Montana, she's so beautiful. And you're thinking, oh my God, I must fix my face. I've got to do something to my chin. I've got to, you know, that, that is absolutely what I found with every single famous, beautiful woman that you might think, God, I'd like to get that mascara so that I look like that woman. She's probably in absolute agony in the taxi on the way there, feeling dreadful. I don't know whether you can relate to that, Kate, because you've come from a similar, you know, reality TV, being hit, very harshly judged by strangers' background everything you've both said, I can 100% <laughs> relate to. Um, I mean, social media, I even struggle with it now, I've got to be honest. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I've fully overcome. I find sometimes if you're not in the best place, it can be really overwhelming. So I've just learned to maybe know how to zone out of social media and it not become my whole life. When I was younger, you know, I really was obsessed with it and it was everything. And I do worry about that for my daughter because mm -hmm. she's at an age where She's obsessed with TikTok and Instagram. But I think just knowing when it's getting too much and knowing when to turn it off is really helpful. And you don't have to be on it every day. And you've got to remember, people put up the best versions of themselves. And they might, <laughs> they probably don't look like that every day. Mm -hmm. Not many people share, you know, the kind of real raw images. So I've been trying to do a little bit of that over the years to try and encourage other people to do that. And also so that people don't feel alone and like yeah. they, you know they don't look like everyone else I think it's really important to be honest and open and share the really good parts of your life but also sometimes they're not so great moments yes and Sarah you've, you've come up against a completely different kind of hostility and you know absolute uh, tidal waves of hatred on social media nothing to do with reality tv but to do with being a an MP so Explain a little bit about what that's like, because it's really, really horrifying when you see the kinds of messages, isn't it? It's horrendous. And lots of female MPs that I'm friends with have had it far worse than me because perhaps they're a bit younger. 
but you will be trolled for everything, you know, your weight, your, how beautiful or how ugly you are, your political views, people will be lying about you, not just about what you look like, but about what you believe, saying you believe things you don't, trying to make out as if you're some sort of demon and um, that you want to, you know, be, be hurtful. And one thing I've got recently is people saying that I want to kill animals, I want to kill dogs. Couldn't be further from the truth. It is really ridiculous, but what you need to remember, girls, is that it is only one version of life. It's not real life. Social media is very useful. It's very interesting. It can take up a lot of your time, but it isn't really real life. So as long as you're grounded and you stick with your family and your friends and the people that you trust, some great advice here from the panel here today, and you will get over it, but make sure it doesn't become compulsive and it's not absolutely everything. It's not all real. Use it, enjoy it, but step back from it. Anybody feels it, some kind of pressure at times, social media? Anybody looks at it and feels a bit sort of kind of sick inside because, yeah, we've got this lady in the front row has been brave to say, yeah, anybody else? I mean, I know you do because, yeah. And, and, and is, it because, is it because of what you might find someone saying about you or is it because you're looking at other people and thinking, oh, God, I'm not doing that and I don't look like that and I haven't been there, didn't get invited, no one asked me, I haven't got that dress. I, is it more, what, what kind of, is it that kind of thing, the second thing? Like not doing the things that other people are doing, not feeling part, yes, lots and lots of nodding and stuff like that. I mean, I can just very, very quickly tell you about me and social media. And I can tell you it quickly because it's so short because I had an eight pound Nokia for years. I didn't have any social media, so I didn't have a smartphone until the pandemic. I only got the smartphone because I wasn't going to be able to see my grandkids in lockdown and I wanted to be able to FaceTime. That's the only reason I got it. So I didn't even have it till 2020. And by the time I got it, no one wanted to catch COVID so no one would get close enough to me to show me how to use the bloody thing. <laughs> so I've never really got the hang of it. That's the truth. And then a year ago, I realised that every time I went, went to do a job, people said, and of course you're going to tag it and tweet it and post it. I'm like, no, I've got an eight pound knock. I can't do any of those things at all. And they didn't think it was sweet and delightful. They thought it was absolutely terrible and no good for business. So I realized I'd better get on it. So I've been on Instagram for one year, just one year, that's all. And um, all I want to say about it is two things very, very quickly. One, I have the comments switched off. If anyone wants to call me a big fat Jew, let them just go and do one. <laughs> Why do I have to hear it, right? I don't have to hear it. Is that true or not true? Raise your hand if you think that's true. Why should I? Why should I? You know, I don't want to, so I don't. So I don't have any comments. So if they don't like it, they, I don't know. So that's why I think everyone loves everything I do because nobody can tell me they don't. <laughs> don't you think that's an, isn't that the nice position to be in? No comments. However, people can DM me, right? Um, sometimes they send me pictures of their important and usually very little places. I always send back a laughing emoji. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> Absolutely hysterical. I think it's so funny in my life as these blokes who think I want to see that. Mm -mm, definitely not, but good for a laugh. Excellent for a laugh. Um, uh, but, but very recently, very recently indeed, I've just had my heart really badly broken. I've had a 16 year relationship come crashing to the floor. Obviously it hurts just as much at my age as it does at any other age. It's home. maybe even worse. It's really horrible. And just to say that on the DM, I have had, I'm not joking, literally hundreds of thousands of incredibly nice messages from women all over the world. It's been amazing. And you know when your heart, has anyone had their heart broken or are you too young? You're not too young, are you? Hands up if you've had your heart broken and you know what it feels like. It's usually everyone pretty much. If it's not you, be aware. If it's not you, don't fall in love. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and, and when it happens, it's hard to sleep, right? You can't sleep. So in the middle of the night, I read the messages. And... Um, and, and I try and reply, but they're just more and more and more and more. But, 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 but the kindness of other women, the niceness, the kind of support from other women, it does help. It definitely helps. It's made a big, big difference to me, the idea of other women everywhere supporting. So I'm going to ask a question now because, because most of your mothers, um, Montana's on the way. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, should I start with you, Nicola, because you're, you're a mum of a beautiful seven-month-old. Tell everybody the name of the baby. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's called Taylor. He's absolutely divine, a gorgeous baby, seven months old, full of personality. And I want to know, what do you hope that International Women's Day will do for your child? I know it's not um, a girl, but for your child in the future, what are you hoping that this kind of occasion might change in the world for your, for your child? Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping that in the future we actually, you know, we, we don't have to do this. You know, it'll be just a given that um, women are, be, are being able to be treated equally on the same playing field. But I'd love to see a lot more of women supporting women and, you know, having each other's back and not, there's a, there's a lot of times where you, they'll get to the top and then they'll take the ladder away so nobody else can get up yeah. there as well. And I think it's about 
handing the ladder down, helping everybody else out as well to, to get there um, into that position. Because for so long, I think women have been pitted against each other. A woman's always another woman's rival, and I've never understood why. When we should be, you know, if somebody's doing good, or even if it's a, like a strong woman that's doing, you know, really, you know, in a powerful position, she'll still be having, having struggles and, you know, not, not, not having as many people um, appreciate, you know, what she's doing. And everybody will think, oh, you know, she's doing fine, when really we should still be giving that support as well. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's about, you know, getting, getting women to, to back each other and help each other out. How about you, Montana? Because you're on the way to being a mum. I don't want my kids to have social media. It's a terrible thing. No, uh, well, I don't think so, but I think it's really hard. You probably, yes, yeah, you like it's really yeah, hard. right. <laughs> um, but I think I think it's really hard because in in one way, I think social media can be an amazing thing. Like we kind of started talking online, didn't we, on social media, and then it's just I feel like women can make you feel so empowered and. There's nothing better than like if you upload something on Instagram, you do a story and then people will respond being like, that's amazing. And, you know, it's such a special thing. And I don't feel like men have that same thing. Like, I don't think men are like, oh, yeah, good one, bro. Um, <laughs> it's just not really the same thing. So I, I actually think women are so special in that way because I feel like female friendships are the best thing in the world because they can make or break you. Um, like I'm still friends with all of my friends from school and from your age and it's just the most magical thing because I know I can rely on them whenever and whatever it is um, so I guess in terms of social media it's about kind of just making sure that you connect with the right people if someone's not serving you someone's energy isn't making you feel amazing they're out the door um, so also just kind of being a really good judge of character and just making sure that everyone on social media is serving you and if they're not then just unfollow or just mute them if you go to school with them it's probably a bit awkward um but yeah just mute them how about you Kate for, for the children what would you what would you okay, like so this got, to do um, I've got three boys one girl who's 11 and another girl on the way which is mental big house um so really I think it's about my daughter Tia she's 11 she loves TikTok she's obsessed with it but I think it can become a little bit much sometimes I just want this day to just teach her that she can do whatever she wants and not to put herself in a box and she's capable of anything and not to let the judgment of other people define her, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, and just empowering her through that. And Sarah, you're actually actively making changes or trying to make changes as, as a minister in charge of um, alerting people to and trying to stop violence against women, including domestic violence or other kinds of violence and tell me how you think that it's progressing because we hear such terrible stories so often. Every day we hear terrible stories. It's across the world. I mean, it is worrying. But one thing I want for my boys, they're all grown up now, they're 21 to 27, is that they, they've grown up hopefully with me nurturing them and saying, you can have girls that are friends. They're not always girlfriends. You should encourage, support and help your friends. And I want them to be kinder. So it's one of the things that I think is really, really important that the government gets out. Could you put your hands up, uh, any of you that have heard of the Enough campaign? Have you seen it on the tubes, on buses, Enough? Just, that's great. It's just that the government have put this campaign out on social media and advertising just to say we've had enough of this. Boys, we want girls to be part of our lives and we want boys to be able to say to boys and girls to everybody else, it affect, violence affects boys as well, it's not just girls, that you need to be kinder to each other and it's not good enough. We've had enough of nastiness, putting girls down. We all need to be friends and have a bit of love. So I hope for my boys, I hope it will be a bit different from when I grew up, when you didn't really have boys as, as friends, as mates. You were very kept separately, really. Um, I hope that we all give each other a chance and encouragement and that the boys and the men in our lives, we can say, and their contemporaries can say, that's not good enough. So that's what the government's trying to do. We're spending a lot of money in targeted ways in making girls and young girls and women feel safer. That's also boys when they're out as well. And we're doing a lot to change the environment, lots of education. Are you, are you girls getting education at school saying, this isn't okay to speak to a woman like that? Are you having that in some of your lessons? That's good to see you nodding. And that's what we want to do. That's what I want for my boys who are now grown up. And I want that for you. And girls, you can do it. Support and call out people if it's safe. And you see something that's not right. The government wants you to call it out. Make sure you're safe. But if you are supported and safe, say, that's not okay. Don't talk like that about her. Don't send that message. That's really nasty. 
It's a, it's a journey that we all need to go on and we can use our best friends. And I like the bit you said about the comfort of your girlfriends. It's great to have girlfriends and we need to encourage everyone. I think the guys sometimes like us to be in competition. Let's not have that. Let's all just be friends and mates. Right, now I'm going to get to the, the nitty gritty of real stuff now because <laughs> we've done all that other stuff, right? Relationships, Nicola. Relationship <laughs> advice <laughs> and how, you know, how to navigate the flipping stuff. I mean, I, I, I you know, it, it's hard out there. It really is. And obviously you had to come out at some point. I don't know how that was, whether that was kind of a given or whether that was a difficult thing for you. I've never heard you tell that story, actually. I don't know. And and just, just the difficulty and what you've learned. I know it's hard to, to, to sum it up, you know, quickly, but about relationships, because I know, I know you're in a lovely one because I've met your partner and you look so happy together. Yeah, yeah, we are. I mean, it's like, yeah, Ella's like my soulmate. But um, coming out was really, really difficult. Um, I, I, was, I was in my teens, so I was like, I think I was like 12 or 13 years old. And um, I remember building it up in my mind for a good few weeks. And um, I, was, I was trying to figure out how I was going to tell my tell mum. My and I, I went through loads of different scenarios. I was like, oh, I'll tell her while um, in the break of Coronation Street because she likes that show. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, no, what if, what if one of the main characters gets killed off and she's angry? Um, so I, was, I, like, scrapped that one. I, I just went, I, I was just so, like, stressed out and stuff about it. And um, I got to a point where I just told her in the, in the kitchen and she was like, oh, I, I already knew, you know, put on the kettle. And I was like, what? I was like, first of all, <laughs> I was like, how did you already know? <laughs> and um, and she, was, she was like, well, you know, you had this best friend and then that best friend would disappear and you'd have another best friend. So I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you'd never talk about that other best friend again. Um, but it was so nice that um, she was just really chilled about it. Like, I, I didn't get disowned or anything because that's the, the, I think that was the biggest fear for me, you know, just not, not knowing what was going to happen. Um, so that was quite hard to navigate. But once I came out, I felt like I had such a big weight lifted off my shoulders, like, because I always felt like I had, I was hiding a part of me and I could never be my full true like self. Mm -hmm. And after that point, I just, you know, I never, I never looked back. I'm, I've always been who I am. Um, every day, so I think it's important to be able to be your, be yourself and be be happy in your in your own skin. Because once you get to that point, then you're actually ready to be looking um, for a relationship and you know being able to be with somebody else. I think you have to be happy in yourself first before you can then go and go and find love. And then that's a whole another different <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> different story. Um, it is difficult to to navigate. I think especially. When you're you're a celebrity, it's, you never know what anybody or what their what their intentions are. Whether they just want to be with you because you are famous, so um, it is it is quite difficult. I was I was quite lucky, really, um, when I actually met Ella. Um, we actually met in a nightclub. Um, she had no idea who I was, which was awesome because I I felt like there was no. Um, ulterior motives there you know she was just getting to know me for me and I, I love that about her and we've been together now almost five years so woohoo yeah <laughs> and and what about you Montana because you've got a lovely partner and I do have a lovely partner yes. but do you know what I actually want to kind of go back to when I was like really young I went to an all-girls school and so from the age of I think, yeah, from the age of like seven onwards, I went to an all girls school. So I had no experience with boys. In fact, I was like kind of a bit of an ugly duck thing, had like really slick back, greasy hair. And no one used to wash their hair back when I went to school. Mm -hmm. I went to a girls school and kind of, we all used to just really express ourselves and we used to be in like chamber choir and there was just no judgment. It was so lovely. And then when like the, the kind of stage came, I think I was 15, there was a local boys school and there started to be these discos. And I just remember being like, oh, I'm obviously going to get a boyfriend. Like, yeah, it's going to be really easy. Um, and I remember it was just the worst experience, I think, like actually having a relationship when you're young because I feel like when you're younger, you have all this confidence and like you you haven't had anyone knock your confidence. All you've ever had is your teachers and your mum being like, you're amazing, you're beautiful, you're fantastic. So you just think you're amazing and fantastic all the time. And then a horrible crummy boy comes along and just kind of 
tears you down. And I remember my first ever experience with a guy, he told me I had a tash. He told me I had a moustache. <laughs> and I was no. like, oh, my. and I went back no. and I was like, mom, I was like, you told me I had a moustache. Why didn't you tell me? She was like, it's beautiful, darling. She was like, it's so beautiful. <laughs> um, and so like, I don't know, I, I think, Obviously now it's so different. I think once you know who you are and once you know kind of you have that self-confidence and, you know, my partner's always like, why don't you shave your legs? I'm like, I don't care. I actually don't care. This is not about you, it's about me. Um, but I think when you're younger, it's obviously a lot harder to deal with the judgment and kind of you think that you have to just look amazing for a man. So I think it's, it's really difficult. And I think I've really kind of channeled that in my relationship now is that actually... I can do what I want. And it's if I don't want to shave my legs, if I don't want to do my hair, if I don't want to do this, then I'm well within my right to do that. That's not going to affect my relationship. And that's taken like quite a few years to learn because I think I've always thought that you have to look like impeccable for a man. And I've just realised I don't need to do that anymore. And so I can look really ugly all the time. Let's just move on to Kate, because I'm looking at the clock ticking. Oh, the clock's ticking. Run oh, my sorry. Time, Kate, what, what about you? Because you said that when you were in town, you were going through a breakup, so the whole world knew about that. So that couldn't have been easy. That feels like a lifetime ago. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that, was, that wasn't easy. Um, and now I'm married, and I've been married for three years, and I've got the most supportive husband. And I've had a few relationships over the years, and I feel like I've never felt as empowered and as happy as I do now because my husband is so supportive of me. Oh, great. And I feel like that really made a huge difference to me. And I've really grown on that since I've been with him. And like he's helped me become who I feel like I've always wanted to be. So just really, you know, like be with someone who loves you and helps you and supports you and like adores you because you can become the best version of yourself. And I'm just so grateful that I've got that. That was a bit cringe, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> what about you, Sarah? Well, I don't think you can find a, a real boyfriend or partner or girlfriend until you found yourself. So I think take this time when you're just sort of finishing off at school, your education, just be yourself, really, because only when you love yourself, you're going to find the right person to love you. Don't live your life thinking, I've got to be like this because then I'm going to get a partner or a boyfriend. Uh, some of you may not meet somebody for years and years, and does it matter? Just be true to yourself. And then when you love yourself, they come to you, and they, you won't be able to fight them off. <laughs> um, so just be true to yourself, and don't think you've got to do any stereotype, this is what's expected of me. Just do what you like, and then that inner warmth and, and that sort of love of yourself that you get when you get older, um, that will come through, and then you'll find the right person. So don't do stuff for anybody else. Do it for you first, and then the right guy or woman will come to you. Don't ask me for any advice on relationships. <laughs> don't do as I've done. That is the crucial thing. I'm the only one sitting here unloved and alone. This is terrible. No one told me it was going to be like they're all so happy and loved up. And I'm like, oh. Hang on, okay. Right. <laughs> onwards, onwards and upwards. Okay, because we're going to we're going to take your questions. Let's come to this this lovely lady in the front row with the with the microphone. Great. Oh, I'm so pleased. This is brilliant. Ask, listen, ask anything you like. If they don't want to answer, they'll just say they won't answer. So don't be shy. Don't, don't not ask what you really want to know. Whatever it is, please do. It's a good opportunity. Yes, please. Um, hi, my name is Vesna. Hey. And I just wanted to ask if like, you recognise the role of intersectionality in your journey as a woman in whatever industry that you're in. And you better explain what that means. It did you, say, like, it, you said intersectionality. Yeah, so that I like the word a lot. I'm going to use it this afternoon on my show. Believe me, I'm going to use it every hour. <laughs> what the hell is intersectionality? So Tell me. The idea that, like, you as a woman, for example, me as a mixed woman, I'm a woman, but maybe the obstacles that I face would be different, or the way I navigate my industry would be different compared to someone else. Right. Because of the implications that okay. society faces. Okay. So I just wanted to ask if, like, do you think that's something that you recognise or acknowledged in your journey? Hell of a question. I love that question. Wow. Yeah, I love that question. Can I go on? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, I grew up in quite a white area. So a lot of the nuances of being a woman of colour, I only really realised in the workplace. And I just kind of thought, oh, you know, when something feels a bit off and you know someone's judging you and it's not just, oh, I don't like you. It's something a bit more sinister. Um but I actually think a lot of the time you've just got to own it and know that like things are changing, but you have to often be the one to call things out and to make change. Um, I have it in business all the time. You're kind of sat in a room full of like white, balding men and you're like, oh, this is awkward. I feel like I'm not getting the same opportunities. I'm not, I'm not getting the same chances as everybody else. And I think it's, 
it's calling out the facts. Um, and I think it's having the confidence to do that and knowing that you are paving the way to a better future of like for your children um, and for people that look like you. So um, I guess it's about kind of digging deep and just knowing that things might be a little bit harder for you um, and they probably will be a lot harder for you. Um, but as long as you have that inner strength, then you can absolutely do it. But yeah, I can definitely recognise it. I recognise it more actually when I was older and kind of coming into more of um, the entertainment industry and also kind of the workplace as well. Now let's ask, let's ask Nicola, shall we? What about you, Nicola? What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, coming from a career in boxing, which is very male dominated, especially in the beginning when there wasn't really any female boxers, um, it was very, very difficult just navigating that through and not listening to everybody saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't do boxing. Why are you boxing? There was so, even um, even going into Strictly Come Dancing, you know, as with a same, same sex partner, um, me and, me and Katia, when you do things for the first time, you never really know what's going to, what's going to happen, what people's reactions are. And yeah, there was some, some bad reactions, but it was about just taking that first step anyway, so that everybody else that follows me, you know, they can, they, they get that chance to do that. And they also see somebody that represents them on TV. It's all about representation and it is hard taking the first step and it will be hard um, for you guys as well, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but it's about having that, that courage in, in yourself, you know, and, and having good people behind you to back you so you can just, you know, go for it and just don't look back and never take no as an answer. Let's bring Kate in because Kate, we've talked about blendedness, but we haven't talked about races and you know blending different different races together. And that's I mean, I don't know how much you think of it, whether you never think of it, whether you're forced to or what. I think of it a lot. So I'm predominant. My whole upbringing was quite white, um, and my husband is mixed race, and now I have mixed race children. Honestly, it wasn't something I really considered until I met my husband and my stepkids and had kids, and now it's something I really really consider. And I do, you know, I've got two books coming out and one of them is about ha having mixed race children. And I do really think a lot of people in the public eye are trying to make change, even in like the last five to 10 years, it's really important. And I feel like for my kids, I do worry. I've had to learn so much because it's not something that come naturally to me. I didn't grow up in that kind of culture. Um, I've had to learn so much from everyone and I feel like I'm on a journey, but I want to make change as well. I think it's important that people of all races acknowledge that some races may not be treated as well and may not get the same opportunities. And I'm really fighting for that. And blended isn't just about blended families. It's about people blending race and, and all sorts of things. So, yeah, I think it's important and it is something I worry about for my children. But I'm hoping to make positive change, even as a white woman. And let's bring Sarah in because you are trying to affect the change that people are just saying that they want to make. So how is it impacting you and what you do? Well, there is massive change. Going back to when I first became a lawyer, just being female was really unusual. And it's hard. Intersectionality is not just race, of course. It's other issues such as disability and colour and sex. And it was really hard. And sometimes I had to really just stop myself biting back the tears when some guy was doing really well, got a better case just because he was a boy. He'd been to public school. I didn't have the right voice. It can be really hard. But what that's taught me is that you just take those opportunities, believe in yourself, but also be kind. Because there will be chances when you look at others who haven't had the same opportunity as you have. There will be ch uh, times when you can actually help that person. So, and you can, you don't have to do it out in the open, although that's better. You can just make sure they have enough time to talk at that meeting or that they get an invitation to come to something which they might normally be overlooked at. So we can all, we all have a part to play in that, but it is something we all need to think about. And I do think this government's come a long way. Um, I think all governments have been on a huge journey and now we're actually affecting change. And it can be exciting. It's not all depressing. We've got good stuff too. And, and do you mind my asking you, first of all, what, which school you're from? And St. Angeles. Hooray. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 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 And, and, and also your name, if you don't mind. I'm best mum. It's nice to meet you. Thank tell, you so much. tell me something. Why did you ask that question? Because I'd like to know like where it came from. Um, I feel like my journey or my approach to the movement of womanhood or like unity as women in general is heavily like affected by my role, my 
identification as a mixed woman mm. and being seen as a black woman by the public, by society. Mm. And I think that my passions, you know, heavily like relate to where I'm from, my roots, um, my origin. And that is obviously for my parents because, you know, they came here, they're immigrants. And um, they came here to give me a better life and to start their own journey. And I think when you grow up where we're from, which is Forest Gate, it's yeah. such a diverse society, diverse culture. You meet so many different people from so many different places. And that's what it's about. Like, So I feel what's really important is we have to recognize that people, they have different starts to their journeys and their journeys are shaped not just by like being a woman, of course, that's what shapes my journey. But also, you know, how I look shapes my journey. What I identify as shapes my journey. And so that's just something I'm passionate about because I want that to be something that's carried through through my work, whatever I go into, whatever industry I'm in. I want to always come back to where I come from and the people that I'm supposed to be supporting my community. So, yeah, I just wanted to know if you feel like that's an issue that you recognise or something that you have to acknowledge. Like. I thought that was beautifully yeah, said. You. Amazing. Can I, can I ask you one more thing? Because you're obviously just a very interesting person, it's quite clear. Do you have any thoughts about what you might do or what you might want to do? Um, I actually studied politics. Ah. So, yeah. ah. ah. I should okay. put my hand up, but it's just because <laughs> my, my perception of like the political world is very... It's quite complicated. It's not as simple. I don't think it is simple. Yeah, like, I totally simple. agree with it's that. It's not simple at all, no. which is why I feel like... I don't know if it's something that I'd be certain to go into, but I do know that I'm somebody who likes to argue and <laughs> likes to get my point across. I like to express my opinion. Yeah. So I definitely think that I would go into some kind of industry or world that has to do with me making a change through speaking and communicating and networking with people. So, yeah, thank you. God, watch out, world. Yeah, <laughs> no way. Watch out, world. All right, who's got another question? That was a hell of a good one. We've got lots of people wanting with questions. Eh? Hello, hi, I'm Hannah. Um, thank you for having us. Pleasure. I'm from the Princess Trust. Great to see you. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for running this event. It's been great. Um, so my question for all of you is I would love to hear about um, what you are all doing in your day-to-day -day life um, or in your careers to uplift women or to sort of help women, um, you know, to push women up in your careers or, yeah, day-to-day -day life. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll start with Nita as usual. Yeah, um, I've actually just launched um, a course with the uh, Princess Trust um, to help help bring women together. Um, they'll learn some boxing. They'll also learn um, a lot about having more confidence as well and a, a whole lot of other things, which it was really cool to be able to actually went, went and met um, a few of the girls and just seeing where they've come from, where they started to where they are now. One, one of the girls didn't have the confidence to you know, even leave the house, and then for her to come to come to the course, and then make new friends, and just have this whole new world opened up to it, it was just amazing to see. So um, yeah, my my that's my that's my thing at the at the moment. Yeah, not bad, <laughs> not bad at all. Montana, are you uplifting women? You see, you're selling your business Absolutely. and everything else. Yeah. Um, so with my brand, Swim Society, uh, we do things called an open casting. So we cast women from all around the UK and they have the opportunity to come down and they cast and we're just looking for women of all shapes and sizes um, to be part of the campaign and we do like a big shoot day. We pick six women um, to be part of the shoot day um, and I think it's really nice because we kind of connect all women and I mean we see the most beautiful women but I truly believe that women aren't accurate, accurately represented in retail at the minute. Uh, which I find is really, really disheartening because I think as well, especially now that I'm going to become a mum, I want people to see people that look like them on billboards and I want people to resonate and be like, oh, that looks like me or she's got stretch marks, so do I. And, you know, I think that's really important. So that's something that I'm doing and that I've done for the past four years and that I'm really, really passionate about. How about you, Kate? Hmm, I'm <laughs> just thinking. Um, honestly, nothing in particular like I'm not doing something huge like you two I'm hoping that just by speaking my truth and being open and honest that helps just the general woman I'm not doing anything huge um but 
But your podcast is doing great things. I think that helps. Come on, men and you don't have to be that modest. <laughs> no, it's but it helps no, men it's and a women. Big hopefully. deal, but it's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah, hopefully that helps men and women, but nothing in particular for women. I just hope by me being me, speaking my truth, it helps at least one person have a little bit of confidence to do the same. And Sarah, you're working publicly to change, for example, um, domestic violence. How are you? How are you doing that? How do you target that? Well, I've got a very privileged job in that I can actually hopefully help frame government policy and the law in this area. And we've got the Domestic Abuse Act. Can I just ask all of you, just to put your hand up, you don't have to give any details, how many of you have actually witnessed or seen a, a guy being horrible to a girl or a father or a brother being horrible to a member of the family? Put your hand up if you've witnessed that in your own life. Well, that's, that's almost everybody. Mm. And that's what the statistics show. So what I want to do is to make sure people have the confidence to speak out against what they see, but also to try and deter people from doing what they're doing. Uh, we have lots of perpetrator programs. That's people that have been charged or involved, found guilty of doing these dreadful things, trying to break that cycle of why they do that, trying to educate people. We've got lots of programs that this is not acceptable. There's just such a lot of work we are actually practically doing. And just to create awareness going for the criminal justice system. Some of you that might not be going into the law, but might be going into politics um, or vice versa. We need to look at how we can help girls that have, and boys that may have been raped or they've been spiked on a night out or they've been stalked. We're bringing in new laws to protect, but not only new laws, but to enforce the stuff we've got already to make girls feel confident enough to come forward. That's really hard in London with the issues we've had with the police but we still must do it. So I'm working also on Operation Satiria, which is where all forces across the country by this June are gonna have new ways of dealing with people that have been raped. Lots of girls don't wanna come forward if they've been raped because they're scared of the system, what people might say, that the prosecution might, or the defense might go into their private records. So one of the things we're doing is new rules on third party material. That's private stuff you've said at school that you don't want if, if you're accusing somebody of rape for them necessarily to know exactly whether you did your homework, whether you're an honest person on your homework. So we are actually doing a lot, and I, perhaps I'm privileged because I can do that now, um, but there's been pre plenty of years building up to it where I didn't really make a difference. I was a lawyer in domestic abuse cases. I helped, helped people that were fleeing domestic violence. So the most important thing we could do is make sure we speak up and we do our best to believe people and make sure the process is fair. Right, let's, let's get into any questions as we can. And I know this, this lady here would like to ask a question, so we'll get that microphone over to her. Nice to see you. Where are you from and what's your name? Um, hi, my name is Megan. Hey. I'm from St. Angela's as well. Great to see um, you. At the start, Nicola, you mentioned um, hoping to not have to do these events to recognise women. Um, what do you think that we're doing nowadays and what can we do more of to ensure that we could um, actually be recognised in the future? I think definitely um, being having women working together and really helping to build one and um, each other up. And for sure, like I, like I said before, I think it starts with us helping each other and not seeing each other as rivals because I think for a, for a long time in the media especially, it's always a woman being pitted against another woman and it just shouldn't be like that. And I think we just need to change the, change the narrative and really work together and support each other. I think, why don't we have another question and then let, we'll see, go on, this lady here, excellent. What's Hi, your name? Hi. I'm um, Roxanne. Hi, Roxanne. Also from Angeles. Good to see you. Um, at what point in, in your life do you feel like you had your personal turning point? Who or what acted as a catalyst for your personal change? Well, that's a good life? question. Blimey, that's a great question. Your wow. personal turning point, your eureka moment, that light, what do they call it, the light bulb moment. <laughs> Maybe I still haven't had it, God <laughs> blimey. Um, Nicola, your light bulb moment? Yeah, um, I think for me it was finding out Ellen DeGeneres, um, I don't know whether you've yeah, seen the chat show American anything, chat show host, we but know her. Just seeing her, her journey of when she first came out and then absolutely just losing um, her career, like nobody spoke to her. To go from that because she was it was in, in a, a, a like a, uh, a long time ago basically yeah. and you know it was quite frowned upon to um, to be gay and just going from there to then not giving up coming back having her own TV show and it just really showed it really showed me how important it is to be able to be yourself and still can continue on to help everybody else that um, comes after you. 
What about you, Montana? Do you have you have you had a light bulb moment? Yeah, I definitely had a turning point. I was in a really unhealthy relationship, and I think I remember kind of feeling like I hit rock bottom, and I had really bad mental health. And I thought, if I don't pull myself out of this now, like I'm heading for a bad place. So I just I remember thinking like that was when I really started my self love journey and just putting myself first, falling in love with hobbies that I once did when I was younger, um, that I kind of neglected uh, because I think in my head I was like the most important thing to me was being someone's girlfriend or like being someone's partner. Um, and actually it wasn't, I just was filling my own cup full of hobbies that I love to do. And I think that was a real turning point for me. Oh, that's a great answer actually. What about you, Kate? Um, I think mine was, I met my husband, as I said before, and I took on three kids that had lost their mum. And I was really struggling because I was constantly compared in the press and in every aspect of my life to their mum. I kind of lost who I was and hit rock bottom and then actually filmed a documentary and I'd never really spoke my truth before. Something I always kept quiet. I was scared of like judgment and what people would think of, think of me if I hadn't got it all together and I wasn't perfect. And from that moment, I felt kind of power in just speaking my truth and not everything always being great. And I feel like it's been a real big turning point in my life, like just acknowledging that things are hard sometimes and that we can move forward with them. And finding my voice, I found my voice then really, I suppose. What about you, Sarah? I think my first, a big turning point for me was when I qualified as a barrister, when I thought I'm never really gonna get there, although people encouraged me, I didn't really believe it. But then when I did my first case and I got paid, and I realised that I was just as good as the boys, I was just as good better. as the boys. She was and then when you, <laughs> when you get better. your first payment, and you think, yeah, I can do it. So I think that was a bit of a turning point for me. So I think independence, being able to be yourself, and be independent, earn your own money. Of course, it's nice to have other people's money, but <laughs> your own money, I think, is a big turning point, isn't it? It, it makes you feel, feel better about yourself. Well, so I just want to me. say thank you to everybody because I think our time is now up, and I, I hope you've enjoyed Have you enjoyed it? Have you found it interesting? Because we've got some very different personalities and different individuals who've achieved so much in so many different ways, and I hope that the message that's communicated itself to all of you is, you know, self-belief is a big deal, not taking no for an answer is a big deal. Being nice and decent so that when you meet people on the way up and the way down, they remember you and they remember nice things about you. They remember when you were the person taking the coat and they remember that you were nice then and then they see you in charge of the whole building and they think you're nice then. That's not a bad thing at all. And love is great if you've got it. And my God, you can soldier on without it. You know what I mean? You can keep going. <laughs> I hope that's true anyway. And I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks, Montana. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Sarah. And thanks to all of you for coming.